Hello, so this afternoon I'm delighted to be joined by Chip Tate all the way from Texas. Hi Chip, how are you? How are you doing? Good to see you Richard. Oh, well, well thank you so much for joining me. Of course it's, well I, I think I said um, you know this evening I'm joined by but of course for you it's uh, probably the middle of the afternoon over there afternoon. In, in Texas. I heard what you meant. <laughs> Now, um, but yeah, so thank you so much for taking this time to, to come and have a chat sure. with me. I, I really appreciate it. And now for people watching this that um, perhaps don't know, you know, Chip Tate, you know, and mm. a little bit about your background. Um, you, of course, mm. uh, probably known ma mainly in the, in the whiskey industry for uh, being the founder mm. and uh, head distiller of Balcones um, Whiskey, right. which, of course, is a, a huge brand now and did so much in the United mm. States to really reignite the craft distilling and of course that's had a ripple effect um around the world and, and influenced mm -hmm. others uh, which we're seeing so it's i'm delighted to, to be able to chat with you um mm -hmm. i wonder before we go into all that kind of stuff i wonder if you were able to give me a little bit of background you know where did what was yeah. your background in in distilling and how did that then move on to to, to setting up balconies yeah um well you know it's kind of a wandering story but we'll say that i i had I had a mixed, you know, educational background. So I actually started in some theoretical physics, decided mm -hmm. instead to switch to philosophy. And yes, you weren't the only person that found that surprising. Uh, <laughs> ended up getting a, a graduate degree in religion and some then education. And the point is I did different jobs uh, for different reasons, having a lot to do at some points. I was the supporting spouse of a would-be faculty member of the university, which means, you know, if a job is offered, you take it and say thank you and ask where later. <laughs> but um, so I kind of did, you know, anywhere from insurance to closed sales to what was necessary in that period. But I guess you could also say I was uh, knowingly or not preparing to become a distiller. You know, the I started a small tech company, I ran various staffs and just all a lot of different experiences that when it came to it, um, skipping forward to I guess it would have been really early 2008. Um, in a way, it was quite sudden. You know, I said, I'm going to start a distillery. But I guess you would say more that it crystallized quickly, you know, that it had actually been kind of simmering and cooking for a while because I'd enjoyed whiskey for a long time. And I should add, um, I accidentally got a distilling qualification. <laughs> so, hey, accidentally. Okay. <laughs> um, I guess I got to look actually because I always forget the year. And um, I guess it was 2000. It was I don't know what it's name enough, don't they? 2002. So in 2002, <laughs> I was in South Bend, Indiana. Long, being sh long story short, I was waiting essentially for my then wife to finish her PhD for us to move somewhere and begin life. And so I was going to start a brewery. I decided okay. to take. Uh, study for and take on my own the degree program in brewing the what was then the Institute of Brewing. And if you're familiar with that, you know, it's like a three day exam. It's a pretty big set of essays that you write. Uh, it's supposed to qualify you, I guess you'd say, for manager level in a large distillery or, or excuse me, brewery or to run a small brewery. And I thought that would be, you know, a good qualification to have and so forth. But as it happens, the Guild of Distillers was combining with the Institute of Brewers. I think they ran away, but anyway, they were and became the unwieldy name of the Institute and Guild of Brewers and Distillers. Eventually, now the Institute, uh, what is it, IGB, Institute, IBD, Institute of Brewers and Distillers. So yeah. the point is, the year I took the test, since they just combined with the distillers, they just tacked a section on they didn't really have time to do its own you know the exam just for distilling so they said okay we'll throw a distilling section on there so i find this out maybe six months before the exam that i've been preparing for you know this is sort of like reading for exams you know you're supposed to do a whole lot on your own and then they'll ask a small <laughs> question and you're supposed to say a great deal <laughs> the right thing so i'm studying along and uh, then I get this letter saying that distilling would be on there. And at first, I'm like, what? You know, this is crazy. What am I going to do? And I get the syllabus, and it's really all uh, engineering type things. And as it happened in a kind of previous life, I'd done that sort of thing. So I was like, fine. So I did it, of course, just because I was going to take that exam, which was now a diploma in brewing and distilling. Now, the very next year, they split it out the way you'd expect to have 
a, so it's a certificate diploma and masters. Those three levels are available individually in brewing or in distilling rain track or in distilling fruit track, but they're three individual, you know, overlapping but still distinct exams. But that one year, as far as I understand, they were all combined. So even though I had no intention of becoming a distiller at that point, I accidentally qualified, you know, in that way. So <laughs> jumping forward again to 2008, when this, this half crazy idea of being a distiller, because I'd never done that before, came to my mind, I started inquiring, you know, sort of asking myself, well, is this it seems crazy. This is crazy. Like, why do you think you can do this? And I kind of run through again, the brewing experience was a big part of it. And to be honest, the fact that that society saw distilling as just kind of, in a way, this further extension of the brewing process, I was like, hmm, maybe, <laughs> you know, and maybe I tinkered around a little bit. And I was like, you know, you, you start aiming at something and you start hitting what you're aiming for and you get, you get a growing sense of confidence like, okay, maybe I might know what I'm doing. Because if you combine the knowledge, you know, kind of an intuitive sense of fluid dynamics and organic chemistry together with the particulars of what you know in, in, in brewing, then of course you understand all the particulars of how the yeast and the grain interact and the flavors they produce and how the precursors for other things. And, you know, there's, there's a great deal of overlap between what a a well-qualified brewer would know and what I would say a distiller should know. So yeah, yeah. Um, that was pretty foundational. But anyway, so in 2008, I found it. It's a crazy idea to do a, a Texas whiskey. And initially, it was just going to be a malt. And mm -hmm. um, I had other ideas along the way. But in truth, part of it was working out the particulars of the malt mill that was making too much dust and all these other you know, things that, that one runs into as you go forward. And um, but then likewise, while I'm coming up with, you know, particular business and brand ideas, there was also sort of a, uh, I guess you say identity question, right? Of other, like who, what is this and what will it be about? And what are the sort of framing notions of it? And that's when I came up with both the um, Rumble and the Baby Blue. And the Baby Blue, yeah. you could say, and don't take this anything against bourbon. I love bourbon. But what I mean is, you know, what would you expect the Southern distillery to make with corn? Bourbon. Yeah. Not we're gonna be anti-bourbon. <laughs> this is gonna be so, you know, that made from an unusual corn in an unusual way and it's and it's intentionally unusually young. Who's in? Yeah. You know, well, that, that kind was of provokes my... that like what? <laughs> yeah, I don't mean to joke, but that was my uh, that was my gateway into Balconies actually, mm -hmm. was the baby blue. Right. It was um, one of those things that was pulled out um at a at a whiskey tasting at the end of the night. Mm -hmm. um to and it is a it is the perfect the perfect uh, I'm for, in my opinion the perfect after dinner dram yeah. or when you want something that's a little bit sweeter yeah a little exactly. bit not it's dessert like coachable. but it just mm -hmm. yeah very, it does it have is, sort I, of that I, butterscotchy quality yeah and absolutely. you know i think it's funny because a lot of the concepts i like are things that when you finally put them together in your head should feel like something that somebody should have done before you just don't know why mm -hmm. they have it you know, like, yeah. why not make a corn whiskey, since that's our main thing, that's really focused around corn, the way that malt whiskey is focused around malt. Yeah. And there's no good reason why not. It just hasn't been a thing, you know, and, and that was both my, my gamble and or my strategy, I guess you would say artistically <laughs> and commercially, is that the last thing it seemed to, to do is just what everybody else is doing, because, you know, why? Um, yeah. And so, and then the rumble was, was really a kind of, I, I didn't necessarily want to constrain myself to Texas ingredients, but I did like the idea, you know, much like a chef, I want to get locally what I can. Yeah. And so I was like, well, what, what crazy idea or not crazy idea, whatever for like truly, not only Texas ingredients, but like iconically Texas ingredients. So things that, or, or flavors that kind of go with, so the figs are, are a mixed bag because of the complications of fig supply that I won't get into, but the honey and the sugar and those flavors, you know, the honey, especially because as you know, honey is very local in terms of the flavors you get. And yeah. this is, this is no thistle honey here. You know, this is, this is stuff that you don't, you don't throw a stick at it because it might throw it back. Uh, it's, it's <laughs> thick, robust. <laughs> uh, really rich honey, and I love the idea of like a saucier would 
taking something fundamental like that and say, okay, this is what I love about it. Now, what is it lacking? You know, what does it mean to sort of round out and bring that, not override it, but sort of bring those qualities out? And that's how I built the concept around it. So again, there's no reason really why you couldn't build a spirit the way that you build a sauce with a few two or three you know key ingredients people just typically don't and we all know that the reason that they typically have it is historical meaning that you know people who grew grain also made whiskey and people who grew fruit also made brandy but what they did is they grew fruit <laughs> so they did yeah, jam yeah. and they did fresh fruit and they did everything because that was their main business and so you know in that vein, it wouldn't make very much sense to cook up something that you have to go and get additional, you know, why would you do that? Why would you just use your own, you know, your yeah. own stuff? So, but again, like a chef, I'm not, I'm not the, uh, I'm not the farmer. So, you know, why, why be constrained? I, I can, I can work with multiple farmers in that, in that sort of analogy. So and, and, that was, that and was it seemed it seems like, um, you know, what I know about Bal Balconies and, and yourself, mm -hmm. it seems that everything, you know, as soon as you had that idea um, and those ideas to then use as local as possible and unusual ingredients, you know, within your, what, what you're making. Um, but that, that carries on to your whole ethos about, you know, everything, as I understand it, like your skills and, and the set. Mm -hmm. Was it, where, where did you first set up Balconies? I understand, was it some kind of like mechanics? Yeah, it's, like it's under a bridge, really. Under yeah, a bridge. It's under, <laughs> yeah, it was this, yeah. it's kind of a briefly an interesting historical building because it had been owned and then sold because when it was built, it wasn't under a bridge, and then the city built a bridge over it, and so they sort of found themselves <laughs> in an under a bridge. But uh, for that reason, we got it for I got it for you know quite a good price. It was one of those like, well, here's the money I have, so you know, you work backwards. <laughs> like, what can I make? Like that one, like okay, that one's good. Oh. <laughs> like, uh, uh, you know, and it, it wasn't quite that simple, but to some degree it was because I was limited that way. And also when you start scaling up, you know, you're going to get bigger, but I knew a good deal about how much I didn't know, you know, like I didn't know what I didn't know. It won't sound too much like Rumsfeld here, but you know, uh, <laughs> the known and unknown and all that, but it just mean you kind of realize you're going to have to dip your toe in and something after that you you'll learn a great deal you know what exactly you'll have to see but it, it's just too speculative to say no 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 it should be three times that size or five times that size or you know who knows at that point so um yeah and then eventually and, it, oh sorry i didn't mean to sorry i didn't mean to cut and i was gonna no, say and then did, did that then lead on to that was it um like with stills and things like that were you because i understand mm -hmm. did you build those yourself the, the stills I did. So the first yeah. set, not exactly in terms of I did basically, but I didn't mean to. <laughs> I meant to okay. modify some existing <laughs> ones, but by the time it was said and done, I replaced nearly everything. Um, and then the second set and the third set, I just built from scratch. So oh. the third set actually ended up becoming replacements for the first set because, you know, this is, this is one of the things, you know, you realize how inconvenient it is to add engines mid-flight. Like it's super inconvenient <laughs> if you really <laughs> want to sort that out before you're in the air. And likewise, in terms of stills, because, you know, you're trying to run a business. It's this, you have to run as fast as you can with your little tiny equipment. You're definitely in trouble, but at the same time, that doesn't really fix it. You realize that you can't make enough that way, which is, you know, so how do you, it's sort of like a triage of time, you know, to what degree yeah. do I try to ameliorate the problem by building more stills versus try to use the equipment that we have? And we, we did our best with both, but we were doing all of that in about a 1,500 square foot space. So that was okay. a bit tricky. And, um, and what was your, and then, was your decision? And then probably two years. Oh, sorry, I think the connection. Can you hear me okay? I think the connection just dropped there. I was going to say, what was yeah, the yeah, decision? Sorry, I was just uh, saying about two years after that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. You go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I was going to say, was the decision to um, to build your own stills rather than get some in? Let's say, I suppose, being in the United States, a lot of people might be tempted to go to Kentucky or you know Tennessee or or maybe get something in from Ireland or, yeah. or Scotland. And was it was it um, because you wanted to be in control of the the kind of the stills that and the spirit that you were making, or was it more uh, sort of but not cost really, or, or yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of it was cost, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I knew yeah. I wanted pot stills. That much I was perfectly clear on. 
and um you know and i would say the same not that we sell very many skills at all but still in the skills that we have sold if you make them that way, which is similar um, to the way, you know, a Forsyth or um, mm -hmm. Abercrombie or, you know, there are the others that you could name, the, the traditional copper, uh, Scottish copper smiths, um, that your per liter or per gallon cost is quite high at the small scale. Because in yeah. some ways, a small still is harder to make than a big still. And yes, there are fewer materials, but that's not as big a deal as the labor, you know, the making sure it's just so. And so, you know, it becomes exorbitantly expensive usually to buy really good, very small stills. So it's not yeah. that they're unfairly priced. It's just, you know, the money I had and the money they needed didn't match up. <laughs> so you say, okay, okay, plan B. And, um, you know, from there, the control factor really came more in you know, you do it because you must, and then as you do it, you realize the benefits of it, right? So you realize that at first it's uncomfortable to have to order off the menu, as in not pick an item from the menu. But, yeah. you know, after a while, you you rather like being able to say, this is exactly what I want, and I want it like this. Yeah. And other people have done, like, I, don't, I don't care what other people have done, I want it like, I want it like this, just exactly <laughs> like this, just make it so, you know? And, and of course, then understanding as a maker kind of what is entailed in that. But yeah. then you can start to, as both a maker, a still maker and a distiller, then you can start to make that sort of cost benefit analysis. And I'm a little, I like my stills the way I like them. Yeah. More like a Ferrari than a Yugo. You know, okay. I wanted to, to, to do what it's supposed to do how it's supposed to do. So we, we put a lot of little details in. Fantastic. And so after- so that was after, a benefit after the fact, yeah. Okay. And, and, and so after, you know, so setting up, um, you know, getting this, this distillery up and running, I guess that took, you know, quite a few months to, to get to that stage. And then mm -hmm. you're, you're producing, um, was Baby Blue the first, first release that you, you, you marketed or was, was, it, was there a couple that went out at the same yeah, time? Yeah, Baby Blue, I think it was Rumble and maybe Blue were both released at the beginning of September in 2009. Okay. Um, and then the, um, I can't remember if it was the True Blue or the Brimstone that came out first that next spring, but within a month or two of one another, they both came out in the spring, the True Blue and the, the Brimstone. And then the malt was later, in part because we began the production a little later, but also because the aging, you need a little more time in the barrel. So yeah. obviously that delayed the release. And so we had, when I say sufficient stock, we didn't have sufficient stock, but I mean, we had some stock at that point that yeah. was aged so we could, <laughs> we could put it in the bottle. Uh, and then you so your the things are going really well. Ten that we released the malt. Yeah, I guess it's a, sorry. It, there's a few connect. There's a few connection issues at the moment. So ho hopefully, uh, <laughs> hopefully things are syncing up. And yeah, you can I know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was going to say, so so things were going very well. You've got all these releases out to, to market. Mm -hmm. um, you're working on new things, mm -hmm. and I guess this is the part where um, you know you've become runaway success. You know, almost. I guess you probably can't keep up with um, the demand. Mm -hmm. You know, for, for some of your products. And like all, right. you know, like all great right. stories, you know, there's there's ups mm. and downs. And um, but I guess then was it at this point right. that then you needed to to seek some kind of investment and and uh, to go on to next to up your production or was it how yeah. many years did it take from well you know without getting into the details, right? Yeah, without getting into the details too much. I mean, the the apparent need for funding wasn't just true at that point. You know, as as the whole venture evolved, that became clearer in increments, you know, first it's a little more, yeah. it's a little more, and then you start to get a better sense of what size distillery would actually be more appropriate and then what that might cost. And then as you move on, you get an idea that it actually costs to run a distillery that size and so forth and so on. Um, so what eventually led to the difficulties was part of a larger, you know, in investment raising strategy that had involved two other people up to that point. Um, and then when this one group of investors got on, uh, I'll kind of sum up 
you know, obviously it was contentious, but what was a little bit interesting is if you read the newspapers and everything else, and this had a lot to do with what their strategy was, but they were trying to paint a certain picture of things. And that's kind of what the media ran with. Now, I don't know if it's ironic or not, but like I never expected to end up in Playboy. Like really, I didn't <laughs> ever expect that. But you know, now I'm looking at a booze rebels, you know, four distilleries, like, cause I'm such a bad boy, you know, cause I'm like, <laughs> not really. But you know, that was their story. So if you read it and, and I guess in some sort of like metaphysical level, it was an artist versus business struggle, but that actually wasn't that at all. Um, whatever their reasons were, what was really going on is they were trying to push me out and take my stock. And they claimed they had cause and I claimed they didn't and they went to court and the court agreed with me and disagreed with them. So that's the uh, short version of that. The gist. <laughs> um, so in, in view of that, you know, I assessed the situation and everything we learned. It just didn't feel like going back was going to work out. Uh, some things that happened while I'd been gone it just so as much as I hadn't intended it or even wanted it, you know, it just seemed I, I don't want to say the better way to go, but the necessary way to go just to, to go ahead and essentially use the court win to force a settlement and uh, have a little bit of uh, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander because they were trying to Yeah going back to an earlier part there was a point in his conversations where they were valuing their stock very highly and so this was the point at which i chose to i chose to remind them of that ah good and, good time uh, well, made from the company yeah and i, I was uh, gonna say this I didn't, this remote fight but i'm sorry i'm so sorry to interrupt you i just say there's still a few connection issues there it's kind of taking a moment to catch up yeah. so, so it's all right i suppose the and i mentioned this to you it reminds me um there's a similar story i was having mm -hmm. a chat with a guy darren rook who set up the london mm -hmm. distillery company seems right. to similarities mm -hmm. between both your stories where you know right. some something you are right. passionate about that you've created um something that's become very mm -hmm. successful and then you know as businesses mm -hmm. often do when people become involved and differences of opinion and things like that it's it, you know it's but of course one thing from from this you know from that story the, the huge success mm -hmm. of balconies and how you know now it's it's a global mm -hmm. brand and and it's something of course mm -hmm. that, that you started and you were you were mr balconies mm -hmm. you know so that's something that of course mm -hmm. your reputation mm -hmm. is it, you know, you're known for Right. And that reputation right. and, and what you did for the craft distilling um, industry in the United States has had a bit of a ripple effect and, of course, has come over here and inspired people um, over here within English whiskey. And that's how we got in touch, yeah. actually, because one person mm -hmm. that um, credited you with giving, giving them a lot of inspiration and mentoring them and helping them was... Um, Max from from White Peak. Um, mm -hmm. So I know that you've you've got a, a friendship with with Max, and and you certainly yeah. some of the advice that you gave him really really helped. And right. of course, that's helping other you know distilleries in England as well. So, mm -hmm. how, can you explain a little bit about that? You know, how did um, the friendship with Max come about, and um, you know, kind of yeah, what what sort of advice did you give him uh, when he was setting up? Right. Well, I was kind of anticipating, and I was trying to a minute ago trying to remember exactly how it was we came. I think he just emailed me, um, but you know that in itself is always a little random. But I try to be. So I'll first of all say, in general, I'm not good about email. But anyway, that whether I found it or it was brought to my attention, I responded to his email and we started uh, talking by phone. And you know, he told me a little bit more about his background, and you know, I wanted to help. Uh, of course, want to help anybody, but he was clearly a guy with a lot of. Uh, great business and life experience and passion and just a lot of, you know, he's bringing me a lot of things to this in addition to just wanting to do it. And so, um, let's see, somewhere in the conversation, one of us had the idea that he should come over and stay with me for a while uh, while we were working on stills and, and try to work through his plan. So uh, that's what happened. I think he stayed with us for a couple of weeks. Um, oh, cool. And you know, we were, he was helping a bit, you know, of course, with this filmmaking as well, but a lot of it is, as you probably know, he's got an extensive financial background, you know, so he had all kinds of, of planning and things, but it came down to questions of, 
you know, what is the right size for the distillery or just, you know, which is of course an impossible question to answer, but I had some knowledge of that, right? I could, I could at least say, well, I could tell you what the wrong size for distillery is. Um, and, you know, so we talked a little bit about essentially how to put those realities together in terms of, you know, taking the financial planning that he was doing, creating some possibilities for future growth, you know, maybe getting a slightly larger still, just realizing where maybe you could give yourself some options for a smaller amount of money than you might imagine. And then other things, you know, for instance, fermenters, they're great to have. You can buy them later. <laughs> yeah. You know, a bigger <laughs> mash ton is, is like putting a tremendously larger engine in a car. Like, can you do it? Like, sort of, <laughs> you know, like basically all I want to have to do is just rip everything out and do it all over, but you know, and then it'll be fine. <laughs> So it's, it's a big deal and you realize like, wow, it'd be much better just to get the one that I need. Um, so we were able to work on a lot of that sort of thing. But um, yeah, I think, I think hopefully part of it was just taking a lot of the pre-planning that he'd done, combining with some of the experience that I was able to gain through those early days at Balcony and then you know, from there he ran with it. But um, yeah. it's, it's always the... Uh, the challenge of being somewhere between the bleeding and cutting edge, you know, you know, there's a great deal that you can't know, but you at least want to try to know, you know, find out what's out there, you know, know what you can. And uh, yeah. so I was, I was happy to help him. Well, as I say, yeah. he seems to be good, um, good reaping the, reward, the, the, the benefits of that now, because yeah. you know, I had That's a video chat like I'm doing uh, with yourself, you know, a few weeks ago. And, and um, uh -huh. you know, he was mentioning that that one, one crucial bit of advice was, you know, he's now got a distillery mm -hmm. that he's still got room to grow into, you know, so there's not going to be an mm -hmm. upheaval of mm -hmm. having to move or get new equipment in. So you right. know, he's, he's still got a lot of space to, to grow as, as more interest, you know. And I think that's something that is... Uh, as English whiskey grows, you know, we've got a, a very great craft, you know, English whiskey scene at the moment that's that's growing, mm -hmm. you know, a, a huge rate from, from yeah. one distill distillery in 2006 to to now, you know, 24, 25, you know, and I know there's a couple more that are, that are coming up at the moment. <laughs> so it's it's getting bigger and bigger. I mean, yeah. in terms of, you know, whiskey distilleries, we're a similar size now to Canada in terms of the amount of distilleries, you know. Right. Um, so similar right. kind of level of, of growth in, in a short amount of time. And, um, right. and that's one challenge that I think some of these guys here are going to have, mm -hmm. you know, so the smaller ones, they become very successful and then, then yeah. they're going to have to upscale and then mm -hmm. it's going to cause a bit of a, an issue. So that's, I think, yeah, that's, that's great yeah. advice that, uh, that you yeah. gave him there. And um, so how yeah. about yourself? So of course now, um, you know, Balconies is all behind you. You've got that great legacy of, of setting mm -hmm. up this, this great whiskey, you know, that's known around the world. Mm -hmm. um, you did so much for mm -hmm. craft whiskey in America. And as I say, that's then had a, a ripple effect across the world and inspired other people um, to, to mm -hmm. set up distilleries or to change their, their the thought mm -hmm. process about how they do things. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got all that behind right. you um, and what, what's new for, for, for Chip Tate? What have you done since uh, Balconies? Right. And, uh, and I know I know you've got um, uh, yeah. Tate & Co Distilleries, which is an exciting project, and you're still building still. So I wonder if you can give us a bit of information about right. what you've been up to. Yeah. So uh, technically, it's two operating businesses. But in fairness, the Copper Works is pretty much to supply our stills to the distillery. So, you know, while okay. in in technical form you know we have sold a still or two that's really secondary you know for the most part you could say since 2015 I've been getting this property and kind of laying in the groundwork um, it's a much larger situation so we have 27 and a half acres um, you know we have I'm trying to think what that is in the hectares or anything but anyway it's a, it's a fair amount <laughs> it's and, big <laughs> um, you know just things like a large water line and all that not that we're going to build it all out or anything like that but kind of knowing where where we will need resources and which resources and which might be hard to get in the future so trying to set up for that now um skipping forward you know so that's that's its own financial project as well as everything else getting all the plans for that and all the funding together and uh, things were almost i guess uh, I's dotted and T's crossed somewhere around the first week of March of this year, which then, of course, 
things got weird. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know so, what? The, the only reason I'm yeah. able to talk to you now really is because uh, <laughs> I, I run a business usually uh, mainly catering to American tourists and uh, right. none of you guys are here at the moment. To, so. right. <laughs> yeah. Before before the world began ending. But um, no, it's... Um, so in brief, you know, the end game will be the same in terms of, because we're going to have quite a bit of capacity. You know, there's, I have materials for or have completed, you know, some combination of those six fills altogether that to put it in comparison is somewhere in the neighborhood of about any size facility. So not exact, but just to give you, you know, a bit of a framework. Now we're not going to have all of that up at first in multiple senses. Um, and we just backtracked essentially in terms of we were going to build a whole new building right now i'm going to use the current building we have instead i'm having to do a lot of the work that i was going to hire somebody else to do you know it's we're actually making great progress just slower progress because you know it's me and three guys so there's only so many yeah, well, and you and three guys building, building something the size of balveni that's that's pretty amazing <laughs> right and i mean it hasn't we've had a few more you know we've had maybe a, another handful uh two or so before and i'm leaving out you know we've got a few people in the office besides but just in terms of hands wow. uh, doing things and, and, and i've so, seen on, yeah. on instagram those those pictures that you've posted of yeah. a lot of stills are they the ones that are going into your distillery or do, yeah. do you do any custom right. stuff for other people or is that just you yes. can't really do anything so like that one, i don't know why well i kind of do know why um uh, a good friend asked me to for a client of his and then kind of said, you know, this is the guy you want to make a still. And I guess part of it was just saying, you know, if you want to be a professional still maker, like at what point have you done that? Well, it seems you have to make one and you have to sell one. Like that is a basic, you know, if you, if you haven't sold one, like, is it, is it really professional anyway? So those two, we did one for uh, a fellow up in New York um, okay. that is very pleased. He's been effusive about it, so you know, very glad to hear that. It's because it's weird. It's kind of like I realized this the first the first time I sent one away, and it's like you know, sending your child off to boarding school or something. You know, like, they'll be fine, right? They, you've got your, you, you've got, you'll be fine. You know, just like you, ne never mind. Like you, you understand that he's allergic. You know, it's like ne no, I, I'm, I'm, never mind. Me. You know, <laughs> it's sort of like you'll be fine. You don't need me. It's, it's everything's okay. Um, but no, we set up a, a nice direct fire system, about a 600 gallon still for him, very tall. And um, that's working beautifully. And then we have two that we're gonna be installing wash stills and two spirit stills. So in liters, since I think that'll be a little more familiar for most of the audience, um, I think we're looking at about 13,500 liters on the wash stills. Okay. Oh well, yeah, yeah, something like that, fourteen thousand, and then yeah. um, let's see, about four thousand liters on the spirit stove. So okay. well, they're, I guess you would say, half size in terms of rather than having two wash and two spirit, there's kind of a two to one ratio if you follow yeah. the spirit stills to wash. Yeah. Big sizes like uh, yeah. compared to a lot of the English, uh, a lot of the English distilleries. We've yeah. even got one. We've even got one guy here. He's using a two hundred liter uh, still. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I'm very sympathetic, but it just you kind of feel like the swimming pool guy, you know, digging with a sandbox set. You're like, yeah. I'm doing great work, but man, it's hard money. <laughs> it's just, yeah. <laughs> you realize the the difference, you know, with you know what the quality of you know what the difference between a two ton and an eight ton mash ton is, six tons. That's the only difference <laughs> and a whole lot of money, you know? Yeah, so God. it just, you know, some things really are quality issues and a lot of things are, and this is a, where we get both some of the benefit of my former, you know, Balcones um, experience and sort of some capital that I brought to it, but also the fact we're making our equipment, we can afford a bit more capacity than would make sense to buy from someone else. Yeah. Since obviously yeah. you, well, you so know, what what's going to be the um, the focus um, for yeah. for um, for Tate and Co um, Distillery? Is that are you going to? Is it going to be yeah. um, mainly whiskey. Main, mainly whiskey? Yeah. yeah. So uh, okay. Yeah. So. yeah, we'll do other brown spirits, kind of in a similar fashion, not necessarily the same ones, but you know, 
whiskey distiller will also play with other other ingredients in pot stills you know uh yeah. brown barracks can't promise that won't always just be brown but that's kind of the generally what i what i do and yeah. uh focused around around whiskeys you know corn and malt whiskeys so, wow. so. and where is the decision of course i know it's in texas but texas mm -hmm. is a very big place um so are you um we're, we're in waco you, actually you're in waco okay. yeah we're in waco wow. so we're right near the waco airport which is of course no no grand you know cosmopolitan uh shuttle center or anything but it's uh toward the north end of town, I guess you'd say, and it's nice because we have good access to things. It's always hard to find where you're convenient to things, but also as an industrial center, wanting to get trucks in and out and other things, not going to be congested, you know, not going to be yeah. either getting in the way of other people or uh, just having a hard time getting things in and out safely, because you're trying to make it green. And, and that Oh, sorry. And how long is it mm -hmm. going to be before you're up and running? Would you say, or hope to be up and running? I know it's very difficult yeah, this we, year, and we maybe hope. early the next year will be difficult yeah. as well. But uh, when you hope it's six to, get to up and twelve running. months, we're hoping. But I always, I kind of hate to answer that question because if someone yeah. pointed out that, that that the answer has changed before, I'd like, yeah, you know. Right. So assuming <laughs> that nothing else crazy happens, which I have to fully acknowledge is totally possible. <laughs> It is, yeah. you know, the times we live in. Uh, barring that, then, you know, probably six to 12 months is, is what the various, you know, timelines should, should allow for. Well, well, that's great. Well, I, and I hope that, um, you know, I, I, I'm able to get back to work or something yeah. to, to save up some money and get a ticket and come out and have a little look you around the distillery. Yeah, right. yeah right. that'd be fantastic. Come stay, now, come stay in the room Max stayed in there. <laughs> oh, that'd, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Well, and, and yeah. I did mention to you earlier, I need to, um, and yeah. I, I can return the fact, I can bring out a, 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 quite a few selection of, as, as many as yeah. of these that they'll let me carry on the aeroplane so we can Absolutely. enjoy a, a drop of English whiskey to, together as well. That would be, be great. That would be most welcome. That would be most welcome. Um, yeah, I've heard good things. Now, you mentioned, um, actually, yeah, I should say, well, I'll have to go and chat with Max, you know, see if we can uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> get, bring one out. I love that. <laughs> um, I'm trying to hold the phone without hanging up on you. Oh, that's a, <laughs> yeah, well, you, you, your arm must be aching by now. So, oh, you, earlier you no, mentioned I'm, I'm that you might be able so far, to. Right? That's the ADD, okay? you know, so just trying to adjust <laughs> the frame here. Um, okay. You mentioned earlier that you might be able to give me a little sneak peek into yeah. the uh, into the distillery to have a look at some of the stills, and that is that uh, is that possible? Yeah. We uh, yeah, let's do no. it. Let's do it. So well, do it. If, earlier, if the connection if the connection drops, right. I'll I'll maybe have to we're, call you back. But we're transferring Wi-Fi we're... systems. So first thing I want to do is I'm going to try to I think oh, you're still nice, doing nice it. Nice photo of you there. <laughs> uh, hold on a second. Let's see if I can get this to work. Come on now. I'm on distillery Wi-Fi. I'm waiting on it. Oh, still I can still right? hear you, which is good. All right. I'm just creating an age for this thing to catch up, I suppose. There we are. Okay. Wi-Fi. And I'm back. Are you there? I can still hear you. I can't. I can see your. I, there's a nice photo of you. Um, you got that screen okay. photo, but uh, I can't see Let's any see. video at the moment. I don't know why. Oh, Let's here see. we go. Yeah, I can see you now. There. Yeah, I've got okay, you now. Okay, yeah. good. Right. So let's try turning it around and see what happens. So, right. So wow. we've got. Uh, this is one of the thousand gallon stills. I mentioned the four thousand liters. Oh, so I can I can hear you. Uh, uh, sorry, I can see the videos quite well, but can can't hear you very well. Yeah, I'm gonna turn down. the rock now. Oh, there we go. Sounds come up a little bit better. Turn down the free and rock. But anyway, so yeah, this is just a lot of the framework that we're building for essentially any. Since I'm building this for the other side of the distillery that hasn't had its concrete done, I have to build it like it's a kit. Wow. Sort of, uh, you know, we call them a, a, a sled system or something like a skid system. You know, basically making it so you can connect all this together, disconnect it, and then all the mounts and other things are, are all in place. You know, to, to have all the piping fitted back. Wow. So, so you're literally you're literally building everything. Still amazing. Yes, much more than much more than I'd like. <laughs> but uh, like so, here's the 
the spirit seed that we're, we're working oh, on. Nice. Oh, nice. Elaborate farming and such. Um, yeah. Let's see. Oh, know, fantastic. And getting all the, all the pipe work down to where it's yes. supposed to and be. And this was all, and this, the, the spirit safe there, that was all built by yourself as well. Oh, incredible. Yes, yes, this is all us. So we decided oh, to beautiful. use copper versus brass, mostly because we had it. <laughs> and so that seemed like a good idea. But, you know, obviously there's a lot that people who are familiar with spirit safe will recognize. In this. It's a very interesting uh, sort of nozzle that's, the, that's on the, uh, where, where the spirit's coming out. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah, I did. So I, I mentioned I'm a bit of a physics geek. Yeah. I wanted something that would keep the flow, although I don't intend it to be fast. I just don't like things spilling outside. And so I needed to control the flow and turbulence so the velocity would keep it inside the bowl under all the various conditions. So I added a few extra turns to basically both put it where I wanted it in the bowl and slow the velocity a bit. So. It reminds me of like an elephant's trunk. It looks like an elephant's trunk coming. Exactly, down. it does. It looks like a great big uh, elephant, and uh, you know you can see you can, you can keep oh, wow. it once it That's amazing. I'm, I'm reaching over here, but yeah, and then the drains and fill cool. mechanisms for the. Um, but that's so that's uh, this is over in the active copper works. Most of the stuff we've done, of course, is where I'm walking over to, to the other side and the boxes so a little wood shop with not so good lighting but you know um oh, so this go. is this. one of the wash stills um so that stands about know, 16 feet maybe 16, okay. 17 feet yeah obviously a much wider aspect than the spirit still so um, here's the other one, oh. and you can see these are our pressure vacuum relief valves. We have uh, big on safety and all that. Yeah. <laughs> we, we throw a grenade in there, not that we ever would, but they should they should be the trick. Uh, condenser, just a lot of other fairly standard things in many respects, but with some twists uh, in terms of how they're done. There's a static mixing system inside this. For oh, great. Fire. These legs are actually a oil cooled system that is part of a larger infrared burner uh, heating system. We use infrared burners, which is a conventional flame. Uh, just a lot of the, the tweaks of things I wanted differently on my on my stuff. So oh, yeah. a couple of casks Point there already part. as well. I can see. <laughs> well, we have, yeah, we have some casks that I brought over from Cognac when I was there in 2015. And um, then, so we don't have any, I do have a few things in Barrow off site as we work through all the licensing things that I've done um, on the, you know, other places. And not very much, not very much, but a few things that might be interesting to. A bit of a it's, a bit, it's a nice big space, space isn't it yeah so i mean this is only a little over 5500 square feet in this area but it'll do fine initially um and as i mentioned we've got another 27 odd acres of property so that gives all kinds of uh, you know possibilities for yeah Oh, that's cool. We got a, a gym up there. This is really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, my, I, I, well, we've all pretty have much. You got had the, here. Have you got people working there day and night? It, it reminds me a little bit of um, in Breaking Bad. You know, when they've got the guys. Is it Breaking Bad? Or, yeah, where they've got the guys that are building the, the lab, and they they have they have to uh, right. They have to stay there all the time. You know, because it's top secret. Right. No, we don't and... stay here all the time for sure. Uh, <laughs> but. We do have a lot of stuff, and and uh, well, anyway, after being sick, and you know, everybody's cloistered, which I'm sure you guys are, you know, what to do, what to do. So, well, we can at least have our little gym here. People can go take out a bit of stress. Absolutely. Uh, it's better than better than nothing. So, that gives you a bit of an idea. Um, fantastic yeah, no, it's, it's, it's looking great already i mean uh, and i see it's yeah it's, it's one of those no things how, it's, it's, how much it's, be, 
Oh, wow. Right. So this essentially is, I can't really, it's farther back than I can show, but you can see that we've got some, some property back here. It's, wow. Big Texas those, sky there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've got a nice Texas sky. And actually, one nice thing is we're right near the lake, Lake Waco. And as it happens, the I guess it was all part of the lake project. The Corps of Engineers, US Army Corps of Engineers did a big wildlife around there, you know, to have the water flow as it should. And so that is what appends and is behind our property. So there's a nice wilderness, you know, kind of behind, even beyond our own property that we haven't developed, just sort of trees and, and such. So yeah. that's nice. But uh, that's yeah, here's our all kinds of, you know, this this is a <laughs> sort of a African bush style, you know, project. We've had to make more things than I've never actually had to use my forge, but I built one. <laughs> oh, just things that very, we should uh, be able to get. I feel very privileged to be able to be getting this um, sneak peek oh, around sure. uh, the distillery. It's, it's great. Oh, it's, it's kind so of hot. fun because I, I don't get out much and. Uh, <laughs> You know, most of no the one does at the moment, do they really? Sort of thing, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> so this is just our own little uh, power plant as we we're getting oh. the permanent power on. I've also had to do our own little three phase power plant with all the requisite <laughs> uh, transformers and whatnot to get the various voltage we need to run the equipment. So oh it's, uh, it's, yeah, you know, a lot, a lot of this people say, you know, what's taking so long? Yes, it takes a long time to do the stills. But a lot of it is, you know, we had to build some aspects of the space to then build the tools to then build the stills, you know, so yeah. we had to build the, you know, install the overhead crane and the, the air system and the power hammers and other things like that that you can see, you know, over here. That's fantastic. It's, it's, wow, good, good, a complete tour yeah. there. That was great. We've gone all yeah, around the go. building and back to the start again. That's fantastic. Right. I really appreciate it. And, now I'm very excited now because I say it's uh, as I was saying to you earlier, it's definitely one of my. Um, I was meant to be coming back to. The, I was lucky to get to the states um, in February, which I can I mm -hmm. thoroughly enjoyed, and before the world locked down. And uh, right. it's my hope uh, to come back as soon as I can and uh, can afford to. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'd love to come and see the progress. You know, if if, mm -hmm. if you're able to take visitors you know, by the time that I'm able to travel again, um, I'd love to come. Yeah. And, see what you're doing there and how you've got on and uh, and see that, that. Uh, that spirit safe flowing which would be great <laughs> yeah i would too no it, it's yeah. coming it's just been a slow incremental process but uh we'd love to have you come visit and check it out and hopefully that'll be not right before you know close to uh distilling day oh, but, fantastic uh, yeah fantastic well, I can see that you've got a lot of work that um, that needs to, and I don't want to take you uh, to, away from that work. You know, we've had a great chat today, and I don't want to take you yes, any more of your time. It. I really appreciate getting the, um, the the tour around. So, so thank you thanks so much for that. Me. Thanks, thanks for joining yeah. me, and and um, I look forward to speaking to you again very, very soon.